All right, welcome to all who are new here. My name is Dr. Michelle Henney, and I'd like to welcome you to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our schedule, so check back often. This video will be available for review after the Journal Club. The information contained in the video content represents the views and opinions of the presenters and does not represent necessarily represent the views or opinions of Relevay Sports Medicine. The mere appearance of video content on the website does not constitute an endorsement by Relevay Sports Medicine or its affiliates of such video content. The video content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The video content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen on the site. Uh, RSM hereby disclaims any and all liability to any part for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content which is provided as is and without warranties. We are looking for an athletic trainer to join our team. This is a full-time clinic-based position working in a sports medicine clinic. Uh, BMO certification is preferred. Please feel free to pass your information along if you know of a qualified candidate. More information regarding applying can be found on our website. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the BOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive the follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we will review questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, Swipe the screen to the left or to the right and the slides will become visible. The recording will be available for review from our website tomorrow. Dr. Uh, Sujan Gogu is a physician who is triple board certified in family medicine, sports medicine, and pain medicine. He currently serves the Rio Grande Valley community as a physician at South Texas Health System Clinics, where he provides quality care to patients in an underserved community. Dr. Gogu earned his medical degree from Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Blacksburg, Virginia, and completed his residency in family medicine at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. He went on to receive specialized training in sports medicine and pain medicine through fellowships at Texas A&M University in Bryan and Texas Pain Institute in Fort Worth, respectively. Aside from his clinical practice, Dr. Gogu is an engaged member of physician and patient advocacy groups, including co-founding Doctors in Politics to enhance health outcomes for all. He is a well-regarded commentator, featured on CBS News, Telemundo, Univision, and other media outlets. He is also a published writer, with his op-eds appearing in notable publications such as Dallas Morning News, Healthline, Rio Grande Guardian, Kevin MD, and more. A native of San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Gogan now resides in the Rio Grande Valley with his wife, and they enjoy exploring new cultures, staying active through exercise, and spending quality time with friends and family. So I will have him take it away uh, as he presents tonight on lumbar spine injuries in athletes. Hello, welcome everyone. Hello, welcome everyone. Sorry for being late here today. Everyone can hear me, correct? Yes, we can. Awesome. So my talk is on low back pain, and I put the title as always be more specific. Um, I think low back pain is just not simply low back pain. There's many different sub-diagnoses that fall under low back pain, and I think it's very important to understand that. Um, let me see if I can get the next slide. Can you give me one second? Give me one second. Sorry, I just got a call. Sorry, I'm like in between procedures. One second. Oh. One second, sorry. What? 
put some of your paper. Well, yes. Who did? He's good. Just leave him there. Sorry. So what I'm going to be going over today um, are these are my objectives. Um, so I want to go over the three column theory of Dennis. Um, and really what that uh, coincides is the anterior, the middle, and the posterior column. And what is really important to understand in this column is that if one column is injured, um, your spine is relatively stable from a pathological perspective. If two columns are injured, you're relatively unstable. And then obviously if three columns are injured, you're invariably unstable. And so what do I mean that by that? When individuals have a disc herniation, you know, whether they are, you know, lumbar, cervical, or thoracic, that typically involves two columns. You're getting your anterior column affected and your middle column affected. And subsequently, when you're classified as having a two-column injury, you are relatively more unstable and you have more pain. When people have a one-column injury, for example, patients after a car accident, um, or some type of whiplash injury playing football, that's a relatively stable injury and they have cervical pain, cervical strain, muscular type of pain. And then turnover when you have a three column injury, you know, a high fall, uh, a high impact motor vehicle accident where you get burst fractures, compression fractures sometimes, those are typically three column injuries and subsequently your spine is relatively unstable and much more painful. And so the, the vertebrae obviously are there, they're designed to protect the spinal cord. Um, they also bear the majority of the weight that's put upon your spine. Um, and you know, the vertebral body is you know, the main portion of the vertebrae. But besides the body, you know, we have the transverse process, um, where you have a lot of medial branch blocks sometimes that go around it. You have the spinous process. Um, you have facet joints that are around it, such as the superior um, facet. Um, and so when you look at the intervertebral disc, which is you know, typically one of the more common causes of causing pain um, in individuals, um, each disc has three layers. You have the nucleus pulposus, the annulus fibrosus, and then you have the vertebral end plates. And this slide's particularly really important um, because oftentimes when an individual, you know, subsequently gets an annular tear, for example, annular tears come among, you know, people that lift heavy weights. Um, and sometimes the thing that really frustrates me when I see a lot of CrossFitters or powerlifters, you know, lift, sometimes they don't wear a back belt. Uh, like they're supposed to, or sometimes they, you know, someone's squatting and then, you know, they hear someone call their name and they twist with that weight, you can develop an annular tear. And the moment you develop an annular tear, you obviously put yourself at increased risk of a herniated disc uh, happening, which is really this gel-like substance that's in the center of the disc that can leak out. And that gel-like substance really um, acts as a shock absorber. Um, and so subsequently, if your, you know, annulus fibrosis tears all the way from the inside to the outside and that gel substance can leak, you know, you get a herniated disc and that subsequently pinches on a nerve root um, that attaches, you know, obviously, you know, uh, to your spinal cord. And so if you have like an L5 herniated disc, you know, that's basically the disc material that's pinching that nerve, causing pain causing something called radiculopathy, which is pain that's going down your leg. Um, and so that's an example. And I think what's really important, you know, to really understand, you know, on this slide um, is the reason we don't heal, for example, the reason meniscuses don't heal, the reason discs don't heal, um, the reason, you know, cartilage generally doesn't heal well in our bodies, there's just not good blood supply to that area. Um, and so if you're a diabetic, you're an individual that has, you know, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, the one thing I tell patients that are diabetic is, well, what's the first thing to go away? All the small micro vessels that are helpful to get healing um, factors to the area that's injured. And so that's why when we get older, we're more prone to having um, pathology because it doesn't heal because all those small vessels, you know, um, don't provide those healing factors to heal, for example, our disc. 
Um, and our discs just do not have good blood supply, unfortunately, so they don't heal very well. Um, and so that's something that's very important to keep in mind how the general scheme of our health is so important when it comes to our spine or any other part of our body is the only way we heal is with good blood supply. Um, so there's various ligaments, you know, in our vertebral column. Um, there's the anterior longitudinal ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament. The ligamentum flavum is a very important ligament to note. A lot of times um, when you get MRIs on patients, you obviously see ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, people develop hypertrophy of the ligamentum flavum you know, after time and injury um, and age, that can hypertrophy substantially. And when it does hypertrophy substantially, you get symptoms sometimes of spinal canal stenosis, um, um, which I'll talk about further in my slide. So it's something important to pick up on an MRI when you see it, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, and really look at your own MRI and really understand, you know, what's the level of that. You have obviously the interspinous ligament, the supraspinous ligament, intertransverse ligament, interlumbar ligaments, which obviously play a role um, to strengthen and stabilize um, your spine. So your muscles um, here, there's many different, you know, um, muscles that are there um, in your spine. I won't really go through these in detail, but I want to touch base on a slide that's called the Serapi effect which basically says all of these muscles play an important role, particularly in athletes, whether they do a rotation motion, whether they're doing a serving motion, whether they're playing basketball, these are all interconnected to allow certain motion to happen, um, to allow you to do your athletic activity. Um, the, the erector you know, spinae um, is uh, an important you know, element of uh, people's spine because it really is the one that stabilizes the spine and allows us to bear the majority of the load that we have. If we don't have a strong erecte spinae, um, it's very difficult for us to deal with shear forces. And so what do I mean by, you know, um, uh, you know particularly a shear force? Well, when you're, you know, serving and you're coming down and you're trying to get back up, you can't just get back up on a serve completely with extension you get back very slow because there's still um, a lot, uh, an element of flexion and extension that has to be controlled in your spine to um, you know, prevent a sudden movement to cause further injury in your spine. And so your rectus spinae is a major, move, uh, major muscle group that plays a role with shear forces in your spine. Um, you have your your smaller muscles like the multifidi, the rotaries, the inner uh, transversi, and these are very important muscles. More particularly, when I see people age, a lot of times these muscles atrophy, and when these muscles atrophy, oftentimes patients, you know, lose their sense of position. Um, they also lose their seg uh, their element of uh, stabilization of their spine. And oftentimes, you know, if you, uh, you know, as a physician myself, when we um, look at, you know, um, medial branches of patient spines um, and really consider something like radiofrequency ablation and so forth, you know, these muscles atrophy. And so one of the big things I really want when I send patients to physical therapy is really working on strengthening these because I feel like these are the most important muscles as we age because they, they're stabilizers and they're also proprioceptive type of muscles that help us with position, which is very important. Um, your quadratus lumborum, you know, um, is a, a muscle group that really functions as an extensor stabilizer, and it also is helpful in tilting, but is also an important muscle group um, with uh, inspiration um, as well. And so this is an important slide um, that I put here. Um, because what when I tell patients or when I tell athletes, for example, that, hey, you need to work on your core. Well, what is your core? Well, oftentimes we think of your core as just your, your abs, your uh, abdominal muscles. Um, but no, it's more or less your core anatomy is a muscular corset. And what composes your core is your diaphragm, um, your multifidi, your transverse abdominis, obviously your abdominal muscles uh, that compose of your internal oblique, external oblique, um, and so forth. But then your pelvic floor and your sacrum also compose that entire core. 
And this is the core that's really vital um, to, um, you know, allow us to do um, activity, um, allow us to um, maintain our strength, um, and allow us for athletes, you know, allow us to really um, be a very competent athlete. Um, but in terms of rehabilitation, you know, processes, especially in the spine, it's very important when I send patients, particularly young patients, for example, if they have, you know, spondylolysis or if they have, you know, a herniated disc that we get their core to be as strong as possible to alleviate as much pressure on their spine. Um, I went over this slide here. Um, so th the only thing I'll kind of mention, you know, on the diaphragm is, you know, the diaphragm plays an important role in SI joint pain. So if anyone has tailbone pain, it's very important to understand the connection between that and the diaphragm between inhalation and exhalation and it plays a big role in core strengthening uh, the Sharpe effect I went to I went over a little bit in detail um, this is a very important um, uh, effect to understand particularly in overhead athletes and the majority of sports are uh, some they deal with some sort of overhead um, element um, whether it's you know pickleball tennis you know golf um, basketball and so forth but really it's these muscle groups and their fascia that are interconnected that you know enhance the stability between your upper and lower body um, um, lower upper extremities and lower extremities and so like i said you know muscle anatomy is really multiplanar um, especially in the athlete so the hip girdle um, you know you have the psoas major which plays is your your strongest hip flexor muscle um, and it has, you know, um, attachment points um, that are, you know, proximal um, that attach near your femur. Um, and it's really important to understand when someone has a strong hip flexor, because oftentimes a very tight psoas muscle increases, you know, a pressure on your discs. And so one of the big things when you have a power lifter, you have a football player, is really understand, you know, how their hip flexion, you know, is, are they really tight um, with hip flexion um, or not? Um, and it's also very important, you know, to understand are their gluteal muscles, you know, in sync with their lower back and lower extremity with their hip flexors, because if there's delayed firing, you know, in your lower extremity, oftentimes you have um, lower back pain and you're not able to compete well as an athlete from an endurance standpoint. Um, so it's very important to, to really um, understand that. So the epidemiology of low back pain, you know, lifetime prevalence is, you know, 60 to 90% of people, you know, have low back pain. Men and women are, are evenly uh, composed of having low back pain. And obviously one fourth of the population has this worldwide and it's the most common cause of disability in people younger than 45. Um, and the big thing to understand about back pain is mechanical low back pain, 90% of it alleviates within four to six weeks. Even with sciatica or radiculopathy, half of that resolves within six weeks, 75% of that resolves with six months. But the problem with people with low back pain is that it tends to reoccur. Um, and people subsequently, you know, have re recurrences, relapses, and they have longstanding low back pain, unfortunately. So what are the risk factors for low back pain? You know, these are some of the easy ones that are very obvious, physical labor, poor deconditioning, um, decrease abdominal trunk, trunk extensor strength, suboptimal movement patterns, um, age, gender, um, obesity is a big risk factor uh, for patients having, you know, low back pain, limited spine mobility, um, smoke, um, smoking, um, and then obviously, you know, mental health plays a big role. Um, if you're not satisfied with your job, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, you know, people's perception of pain um, will subsequently therefore be higher. Um, and so it's very important to um, address that um, as well. And so here's a slide um, that's here, you know, persistent low back pain is a relatively common complaint after an acute injury in motor vehicle accident. What percentage of people, you know, report pain you know, um, after a year, and you know, oftentimes it's almost you know 90%, unfortunately, in some shape or form. So it's just important to understand that back pain can reoccur um, for individuals. So low back pain is not a symptom; uh, is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. And so I think it's very important that we as physicians 
Um, and even athletic trainers, when you see a patient that you just can't ignore low back pain, be like it's a low back pain strain or it's a low back pain injury. You know, I think patients deserve a very specific anatomical diagnosis when possible, because that's the only way you can really truly treat the patient to the best of your ability. And so there's many different pain generators, you know, in a patient having low back pain, their disc, you know, um, their facet joint, um, their sacroiliac joint, um, uh, patients, you know, nerves and dura and ligaments, uh, particularly stemming from their anterior and posterior and longitudinal ligament, various muscles, the vertebral body and sacrum, um, and the periosteum. So there's many different pain generators and you have to understand um, what the pain generator is for an individual. The differential diagnoses for patients with low back pain, um, there's it's wide ranging. It can be anything from a structural element to an infectious, to an inflammatory, to metabolic, to a neoplastic cause. And so you just can't say, well, someone has low back pain, let me, you know, you know, not look into some other causes. Obviously, some of these causes could be in patients that are much more older. Um, but some of these could be in, in people, you know, um, that are, you know, a lot younger. You know, I've seen, you know, patients um, that have had, you know, osteomyelitis when they were very young um, that was missed, you know, um, for example. I've seen, you know, patients have discitis um, when they were young as well. So I think you have to, you know, obviously rule out some of these things that are much more rare um, as well. Um, but the majority of, you know, low back pain is structural. Um, so what's important, you know, in diagnosing low back pain, you can honestly diagnose low back pain, a lot of low back pain with what's the story of the individual? How did they get hurt? You know, was this an individual that was, you know, um, uh, a uh, pole vaulter? Um, is this an individual that is um, doing hurdles daily? Is this an individual in gymnastics? Um, is this an individual that's playing football and is an offensive lineman? A lot of times you can get your stories and you can start to develop patterns and, you know, what injuries occur in what populations, especially when you're an athlete. You know, an offensive lineman is more commonly going to get, you know, a herniated disc versus a pole vaulter or someone doing gymnastics can develop spondylolysis. So I think you can pick up on different things versus, you know, maybe a 50 year old that's a biker for their whole life that was playing sports their entire life might have spondylosis. So there's many different ways, you know, um, an individual can have a presentation of low back pain. So it's very important to understand the story. And so there's different myotomes of the lower extremities. You know, obviously we check reflexes, we check dermatomes because that tells us maybe what nerve root, muscle group is affected. So it's important to kind of, you know, understand, you know, these myotomes um, in an individual um, as listed on this slide. Um, there's various dermatomes as well, and you can pick up patterns of radiculopathy um, or sciatica based on, you know, understanding this slide. You know, if an individual has knee pain, it might not be knee pain, it might be actually stemming from their back from an L4 nerve root. If an individual has foot pain, you know, it might not be plantar fasciitis. It might be, you know, something stemming from S1 or L5, for example. So there's many different conditions that can kind of interconnect and actually could be low back pain instead of something simple like knee pain or plantar fasciitis. So it's very important to pick on, pick up on that. The one thing on, you know, um, spine disorders, you know, is you don't image, obviously, everyone with spine pain. You know, it's a lot of radiation. It's an increased cost. Um, and oftentimes a lot of findings on low back pain are kind of clinically irrelevant. Um, you could have an x-ray like this, you know, which has, you know, a little bit of degenerative disc disease, but this patient might not be in pain. Um, you can see anterior osteophytes that are formed, you know, as, as, as well, you know, on this x-ray, but they not, they might not be, you know, um, you know, clinically relevant. So I think it's important that you can see facet arthropathy. They, they, may, they might be in pain, but having an x-ray and correlating an x-ray at the physical exam is very useful. So that's one thing, you know, I think is very important to understand. And many, you know, degenerative abnormalities are commonly found on spine imaging. And MRI is, an evalu is a very important tool 
but you know they can be asymptomatic even with findings. You can have an MRI and people will come to me often that says, hey, my MRI has an L2, L3 herniated disc and that radiologist wrote that. But symptomatically, when you assess them, they might not have a herniated disc that is showing you, you know, L2, you know, nerve root radiculopathy, for example. They might have spinal canal stenosis, but it might not show that. And so oftentimes when you get an athlete and they have an MRI and they come to you and they say, hey, you, you know, my MRI shows you know, a herniated disc, you know, you got to step back a little bit and see, hey, what are your symptoms that are happening here? Um, does that really correlate with what this MRI shows? I think it's very important to um, understanding um, that as well. Um, and so that's why it's so important that, you know, in history physical, they guide imaging decisions, but otherwise you should really try conservative therapy first. Physical therapy is vital. Um, to try first, but you should image someone if they think there's risk factors, obviously. If you think they have, you know, spinal infection, cancer, they have really bad neurological deficits or weakness in their upper or lower extremities, um, they have bowel or bladder incontinence, for example, you know, those are things that you're like, you know, maybe we need to get a um, MRI. Um, and so what is important in the history, you know, you got to get the mechanism of injury. You got to understand, do they have a prior history of low back pain? Um, is it radiating the duration and progression of it, the location and characteristics of this? Are there aggravating and alleviating factors? Have they had prior surgeries? Is this a workers' comp legal issue? Are there other joint problems? Um, have there been any pri prior diagnostic tests or treatments tried? It's very important to get this whole story of their, an individual's low back pain because oftentimes when you see an individual with low back pain, it's not the first time you're seeing them with low back pain. You're probably the second, third, or fourth person that they told that they have back pain to and they've tried various different things. So there are red flags, obviously, you know, like I mentioned in the last slide, you know, um, infection, tumor, fracture, cardioquina, you know, obviously if any patient has a red flag, you need to send them, you know, to get imaging, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and these are some other red flags, you know, that obviously, you know, you have to think of on the back of your head, you know, when they have back pain and they have some of these signs, you know, this is concerning, you know, have they had a recent bacterial infection, you know, are they developing osteomyelitis in their spine, you know, are they an IV drug abuser, you know, do they have a history of cancer, you know, unexplained weight loss, you know, some of the, all of these are various factors and could be uh, uh, something that could be contributing to their low back pain, but it's never... It's very important to keep in your differential. Um, red flags from fracture are very important. You know, obviously, if you, you know, an individual that is uh, older, um, over the age of 70, um, and um, you've sustained falls and you don't get proper DEXA scans, not taking vitamin D and so forth, you're at very high risk of compression fractures. And I tell patients, you know, it's very important to follow the USPSTF criteria in making sure you get your DEXA scan at the appropriate age um, of 65. If you obviously have a family history of osteoporosis, maybe even get that sooner, but it's very important that, you know, patients get DEXA scans done, patients stay active, patients take vitamin D and calcium, because that's your only way of really preventing possible compression fractures in your spine. Um, and compression fractures, you know, um, the one thing is very important, they have a lot of pain, you know, in extension, but they also have a lot of point tenderness in their spine as well. And not all compression fractures, you know, need to go, um, you know, for kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty um, or so forth. Oftentimes, um, some of those, um, uh, that, that, that uh, um, condition, can be really treated with physical therapy and a proper, you know, back brace. Red flags for cardioquina. This is important to pick up on, um, especially, you know, an individual that's had a prior herniated disc and it herniates even further. Um, you obviously have bladder dysfunction, loss of anal sphincter tone, fecal incontinence. You have numbness in the groin area, and really you have progressive lower extremity weakness. You know, I've seen this in power lifters as young as 30 in patients that are as old as 60 um, that have developed red flags for cardioquina. Um, and honestly, I've seen a retained bladder at times when I've ordered these MRIs and I see this level of um, herniation. Um, these patients got to go to the emergency room stat. Um, you have to send them. So if, they, if an in, any individual you see that has lower extremity weakness, numbness in their groin area, you know, um, 
loss of bowel, bladder incontinence, so forth, they need to go to the emergency room. Um, it's vital to pick up on that. Mechanical low back pain, you know, um, like I mentioned, um, a lot of it is due to muscle strain and sprain. Some of it is due to degeneration. Some of it is due to disc herniation. Some of it's due to compression fracture. But almost 70 to 80 percent of mechanical low back pain is a strain or sprain. This is what we will come across. And this is caused by patients that have increased stress. Increased stress is just not you know, lifting heavy objects, increased stress is a lot of flexion, a lot of extension, a lot of rotational movement as well. Um, and, you know, sometimes you might not even find the exact etiology of where this strain pattern exactly is occurring, right? There's many different uh, strain or sprain, there's many different ligaments that could potentially be sprained in your spine. There's many different muscles that could be um, interconnected with your spine that could be causing this low back pain. Um, but it's very important to understand that, you know, a big majority of back pain is really strains or sprains. So here's a simple case, you know, a 38 year old male with an acute onset of midline low back pain when playing touch football with his kids, you know, pain is an eight out of 10, but it's radiating down his left buttock and hip. Patients come to me oftentimes saying, this is sciatica. Um, the pain is increased with sitting on and on activity and it's improved on, you know, laying down coughing causes severe pain there are no red flags here so you might be like well this could be lumbar radiculopathy this could be something muscular you know what is probably causing this pain when you do a physical exam you know when they come to the you know office you know they prefer to stand they don't want to sit their strength and reflexes are normal which is reassuring you know it tells me that you know maybe this is not a herniated disc that's impinging on a, on a nerve root but i can't exclude it completely they have pain with all planes of motion, which is common in the strain and sprain. They have focal tenderness on their lumbar paraspinal muscles. Yeah, common in a sprain and strain um, as well. Um, so what do you do in these type of patients? You know, initially, do you get an MRI? Do you get, you know, um, a stat uh, procedure that needs to be done? Um, oftentimes in these patients, you know, it's relative rest, you know, education, reassurance. Heat and ice is vital. Physical therapy is very important in strengthening an individual's core. Um, manual and OMT is very helpful. Um, a lot of studies show um, how manual and OMT have a lot, a lot of short-term benefits with very minimal side effects. And so, um, very important thing to consider, you know, for your patients. These are patients that don't need, you know, epidural steroid injections um, because it can lead, you know. Um, oftentimes if you use this to osteoporosis. So you gotta be careful on how you use your epidural steroid injections. You don't wanna send a patient unnecessarily for a procedure that they don't need. Um, and then surgical intervention should only be used if it's mandated. Um, mechanical low back pain presents oftentimes it's a very normal X-ray, um, a very oftentimes normal MRI. You might look at this MRI and be like, doc, L4, L5, L5, S1, I can see a little bit of a protrusion is this something concerning? Well, you look in the axial view, you don't really see any impingement, you know, on any of the right or left side um, of their nerve root. So this is, to me, is not concerning. Yeah, they have a mild protrusion, but is there something that we need to do about this? Does this patient need an L4, L5 fusion? Does this patient need an epidural? No, they don't. Um, and it's very important, you know, when patients get their MRI that you really explain their findings to them properly. Um, so a lot of times with mechanical low back pain, you know, you rest and reassure these patients and you make sure that you keep them active. Um, you get them to physical therapy, you strengthen their core, um, you get them a short course of manual or OMT. A lot of physical therapists use the McKinsey method on physical therapy. What the McKinsey method really does is really tries to isolate all their low back pain to one particular point and really work on that element only, but they have to treat the other things first before they isolate it to one area. And it's a very helpful technique um, that is used by physical therapists. Um, you keep these patients active. You limit the use of controlled substances. Uh, I prefer patients not using controlled substances with mechanical low back pain. If anything they need, I tell my patients to use Tylenol or Aleve if needed. Um, and then you give them the appropriate you know, medications for pain relief. There's a study here on OMT um, that shows um, 
um, how important, you know, OMT could be used with um, patients with low back pain. There's been studies that show that um, patients get substantial um, relief um, with OMT. So it's something to consider um, if you have the opportunity um, to do OMT, because studies have shown that patients that do get OMT, they need less of other things, less analgesics, less muscle relaxers, less physical therapy. So um, if it's something that's available, um, you should definitely um, try using it. Um, I won't go into this slide here. Um, I won't really go into um, OMT in specific. I have these slides there if you want to reference it um, in terms of um, what there is to do. Um, I went over the McKinsey method, so I won't go into this in, in true nature. Um, SI joint pain, I'll talk about briefly. Um, SI joint pain is, is, is common. Um, obviously, um, pain is maximal at the SI joint and the PSIS. There's many different tests you have to do to pick up on this. You know, you have to do faders, you know, Gaislin's test, compression test, distraction test. No single test is reliable. But what is really important to pick up on an SI joint is it's very common in patients that, you know, um, have had breathing abnormalities, surprisingly. Um, patients that have been pregnant in the past and are now trying to be an athlete. Um, patients that have fallen down. Um, so it's very important to get a good history to really see does an individual have true SI joint pain. If an individual has had a prior lumbar spine surgery or particularly a fusion, they're very high risk of having um, sacroiliac iliac joint pain. Um, so very important to pick up on. I, I do ultrasound guided hip uh, SI joint injections. There's many ways you can treat this. Um, obviously, if you get the proper diagnosis, you know, uh, steroid injections are helpful. Dry needling is helpful in the area. Physical therapy is helpful in the area. You just have to find the right modality um, to obviously treat these patients. Um, this is just a slide on how you, you know, target, you know, the SI joint, whether it's ultrasound guided or fluoro guided. Um, spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. So very important slide, you know, to pick up on. It's very important to particularly pick up on spondylolysis. This is very common in, in patients that are younger than age 18. I see this oftentimes in my gymnasts and my pole vaulters, um, sometimes even my baseball pitchers that have really heavy rotational force. Um, and it's very common, you know, at L5, um, and it's not as common at L4. The pain is worse with, you know, lumbar extension. Um, and these individuals, you know, what you do is you put them through a stork test where you put them on one leg and you hyperextend them and then you have them rotate. And oftentimes these patients, you know, will have pain um, in their lumbar spine. Pain is typically worse um, with these patients, you know, in extension um, and symptoms that are included on this are stiffness, you know, limited motion, paresthesias and pain. Um, and usually you get spondylolysis with repetitive micro trauma. Um, and oftentimes I see patients that have spondylolysis with low vitamin D levels. Um, I oftentimes view this sometimes similarly to a stress fracture and kind of how you go about treating it. There's many ways you can go about treating it. Getting a vitamin D level is vital. Um, getting a strong core is very vital. Rest is important for a few months. Um, and then a slow return to play activity with obviously modification um, if they have improper form is vital in an individual that has um, spondylolysis. Um, spondylolisthesis is something that you have slipped this basically. Um, and that can develop from an individual that has had possible spondylolysis that was undiagnosed. Um, so what I really tell patients sometimes is they can have spondylolysis at a young age and later on develop spondylolisthesis because they don't have that subsequent backstop um, that is there to prevent that shifting of motion. And what's so important, you know, what I do for patients is oftentimes I do flexion and extension x-rays. You can do just a normal lateral x-ray and you might not pick up on spondylolisthesis until you do flexion and extension. This is one example, case in point, um, right here. Um, and spondylolysis, sometimes you don't, you don't pick that up on an x-ray, you need an MRI. 
Um, but you have to clinically diagnose this and pick it up. And really the history guides you towards getting an MRI in these patients. If I have a athlete that's doing a lot of hyperextension activities, uh, one that has a lot of torque motion, you know, they can they get spondylysis, you know, very often. And so what do you do for these patients? I, I went over this, you know, briefly, you know, relative rest is important. Physical therapy is important. Bracing, you know, is important. Um, Short-term analgesics is important. You know, you can try, you know, epidurals if needed. Um, and then surgery obviously is necessary, particularly for spondylolisthesis, not as often for spondylolysis unless it's refractory and they failed, you know, everything. Radiculopathy is commonly referred to as like, you know, sciatica or a pinched nerve or so forth. Really, it's irritation of a nerve root and it's most commonly caused by disc protrusion. Um, and it can be caused by stenosis, you know, bone spurs, um, so forth. It's very common at L5, S1. In the neck, it's very common at C6, C7, C7, T1. Um, patients can have pain by simply sneezing or having a bowel movement. Oftentimes, that pressure downward can cause pain. Um, and oftentimes, they have leg pain more than back pain. If an individual is having low, uh, leg pain more than flexion and extension pain, that's probably radiculopathy over something like facet arthropathy. Um, and this is simply diagnosed by, you know, observing their symptoms, uh, you know, looking at dermatomes and myotomes, but also something simple like a straight leg raise. If they do a simple straight leg raise and they're having pain going down their leg, well, they probably have a herniated disc causing radiculopathy. If you do a spurling test where you take your neck and you hyperextend it and rotate it and they have pain going down their arm, that's probably radiculopathy from their neck. It's probably not a neck stinger or brachial plexus injury. Those are important to distinguish between. Um, so our patient that was, you know, um, for example, here, if you have a 42-year-old male runner that has an abrupt onset of right-sided back, hip, and proximal thigh pain, um, and they can't sit down and they have numbness in their anterior thigh, but they have weakness in their leg, that is a sign of possible, um, you know, um, lumbar radiculopathy. And you can pick up on this very simply on exam when you do a straight leg raise or, or a reverse straight leg raise um, as well. Um, and then you'll notice weakness on strength testing as well. So this is something that, you know, can be picked up and needs to be managed, you know, appropriately um, when all said and done. And so this is obviously a normal MRI of an individual with low back pain, but you can see here, this is a herniated disc that's classic. Um, and you might be wondering, you know, does these, do these need surgery all the time? And the answer is no. Um, you know, if I have an individual that has a herniated disc, sometimes I have patients that have an MRI like this, but they have no weakness down their leg. They have just a little bit of numbness, but there's no weakness. Oftentimes I'll try a transferaminal or lumbar ESI, get them to therapy and see if they can self, uh, if they can improve on their own. A lot of disc herniations can reabsorb and dissolve and get better over time. It just takes a long time. Um, but oftentimes if they don't and they get, you know, weakness um, and pain that's constant and all other conservative options are failed, you know, these patients, you know, go through a possible microdisectomy um, to, um, you know, get rid of the, the pain. Um, and so this is basically, you know, how you kind of treat, you know, lumbar radiculopathy. I kind of went over this, so I'll, I'll let it be. Oh, let me go the other way. Oh, and this is how you kind of target, you know, interventionally a lumbar radiculopathy, for example. This is the caudal ESI I was showing um, that can be done under ultrasound or under flora guidance. I went over this. So spinal stenosis, this is not common in the younger athlete. Um, this is much more common in a much older individual. Um, and it's narrowing of the spinal canal Oftentimes these patients state that when they're in flexion, they're much more comfortable. The one question I ask a lot of older patients if they have spinal stenosis is when you go to Walmart or you go to Kroger or, or HEB or whatever grocery store you go to, do you need the grocery cart in order to, to, to get through um, your day? Um, the most common cause of spinal stenosis you know, is you know, uh, degeneration um, of your spine. Um, that causes, you know, spinal stenosis, but also, you know, patients get ligament and flavum hypertrophy, patients get facet hypertrophy, patients get uh, disc protrusions, all of that can combine to cause spinal canal stenosis. 
And really, you need to pick up on that based on history, clinical exam, imaging techniques, um, and so forth to pick up on that. Um, and spinal stenosis, like I mentioned, is common in the in the older population. Um, you can have a 68-year-old female that's an active walker with a two-year history of pain in the back and legs. Um, it can be episodic and progressive. Um, the pain is present with standing and walking, but it's relieved with sitting and lying down. Um, oftentimes, these patients have normal strength, but they have a lot of more proximal weakness. Um, and their straight leg raise is negative. They don't really have pain that's going down their legs. Um, but if you start to notice, you know, they have reduced pedal pulses, um, that could be something different. It might not be spinal stenosis. It might be some type of vascular insufficiency or ischemia. So it's something to keep in mind as well. Um, in an individual that's getting progressive tiredness as they're walking, you know, is it really their back that's causing this? Or do they have some type of vascular in insufficiency? Something you're not going to see in a young athlete or anything, but you might see in an older athlete. So it's important to um, distinguish that. Um, imaging of these patients, you know, you see um, uh, a narrow spinal canal. Um, that's that's obvious. Um, neurogenic spinal stenosis, you know, is basically um, where you have leg pain that's greater than back pain. Vascular claudication or vascular problem is something that's relieved with rest. So if you have an, an individual that is, is having to flex forward and they're having a little bit of proximal leg pain, they're older, that could be a possible neurogenic claudication. But if you have an individual that's hypertensive, diabetic, is an athlete, and is getting pain with exertion, that might not be a low back issue. That could be a vascular issue. So it's it's just important to keep your scope of thought processes on pathology as wide as possible. Obviously, there's more common causes, but I try to present you know the whole picture so you have multiple thought processes and what this could possibly be. And there's many different treatments for you know um, spinal canal stenosis. The most common right now that's happening um, is minimally invasive lumbar decompression, um, which is basically uh, relieving pressure um, uh, by um, um, uh, scraping off the uh, ligament and flavum is one of the more common causes um, that's being done. But you have to obviously look and see where the stenosis is really coming from. So there's also rheumatological causes um, of, you know, back pain. Um, I won't go into this slide in detail. I put this slide there. It's a very rare cause, um, but it is a cause that is there in among 5% of patients with chronic lower back pain. Um, so if you have an athlete that's you know 20 to 40 years um, and you ask them their history, um, you know, are they having a lot of morning stiffness? You know, is exercise making this feel better? Has this pain gone on for a multitude of months? You know, it could be that they have something called, you know, uh, an ankylosing spondylitis. Um, but the problem you often see is this x-ray that you see here, you know, you won't pick up on ankylosing spondylitis, unfortunately, at when it starts at age 25 or 35. You pick up on this at age 50 or 60. Um, and so you have to really, you know, um, ask a good history and get a um, good uh, family history sometimes to really, you know, see is this something that's, you know, causing this um, to really pick up on it. And like I mentioned here, you know, x-ray changes are very late um, that are found. Oftentimes you miss this because symptoms develop much more later um, in life. And there's just a lack of awareness in society really on this. Um, to really make the diagnosis though, it's, it's difficult. Um, I think a lot of physicians probably miss this diagnosis, to be quite frank with you. But the only way you can diagnose this is actually looking at the SI joint, um, to be honest with you. So um, just something to keep in the back of your mind if you have a young athlete and you have a family history of this and you have a lot of family history of rheumatological concerns, you know, maybe they have this that's developing, you know, something to keep in mind. Lumbar spine fractures, it's important to know this. Um, because this can happen, you know, from a simple fall, a simple high impact, you know, injury. Um, it's important to understand the two column, three column theory here. A lot of burst fractures are three column injuries. And so they're unstable. They need to go get surgery. 
if they are stable, you know, if it affects only two columns and they just need the TLSO for a couple of months. Um, but you obviously want a spine surgeon to, to be on board because you want to make sure it, this patient's not going to do something to progressively, you know, get worse. Compression fractures, you know, um, oftentimes these are stable by just simple bracing. Um, but if they have, you know, greater than 40% body loss, um, then you need to really consider does this patient um, need a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. So this is something in an older population um, that you're going to see. What's the most appropriate, you know, um, brace for a patient with compression fracture? It's the Jewett back brace. That would be choice D. Um, that's important, you know, to, to, to know. So the, the new things, the new therapies that are kind of emerging, you know, now obviously we have epidural steroid injections that, you know, have, you can do steroid, um, that's there, but there's a lot of regenerative medicine therapies that are coming out. I just put this slide in there to really, you know, widen your scope of differential and treatment um, if needed. Um, obviously PRP, you know, um, is something relatively new. Um, a lot of people are doing this. Um, it is something that could be helpful. Is it the right thing to do for every patient? Not really, but you really need to know your patient to know if this is a viable treatment option. Patients will ask you for this. Um, athletes will ask sometimes for something cutting edge and you just need to know, is this something that's effective? But it is an option you know, for patients. Um, I just put this slide here for spinal cord stimulators. You know, If you have a patient that's had failed back surgery, this is a viable option for treatment. Um, I won't go through this in full detail. Um, I just put the slide on really kind of the mechanism of action and so forth. But um, these are my references. This is my email. Um, this is my phone number. You know, I apologize for being late. I have had a busy day with a lot of procedures and so forth. So I apologize for being late, interrupting this a little bit. But thank you so much for hosting me. Um, I really appreciate being out here. Awesome. Absolutely. And we already have several questions here. Let me, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so I can read it. All right. How do you go about presenting and explaining MRI findings with patients who may have Googled their results or previously been told they have severe findings, but you determine they are minor? Yeah, I do this all the time. That's an excellent question. Um, the one big thing I obviously go with patients is what are your symptoms? You know, what is, how do you feel? You, you treat a patient, you never treat an image, an MRI or an x-ray. That's first and foremost. So if my patient, you know, has no leg pain, no back pain, but they have an MRI that shows all this stuff, you know, I really say we don't really treat the image, we treat the patient. But an MRI is important to, correlate with a um, with the patient's symptoms. So I don't dismiss their findings. I tell them there are findings here. There are ways that we have to manage this, but I don't completely dismiss them either. So if there's, for example, if there's an MRI of a patient that shows, you know, um, moderate to severe facet arthropathy, um, and they come to me and they're like, doc, I get flexion and extension pain occasionally. I don't get that very often. Well, I then tell them, you know, your MRI shows this. It doesn't mean we need to do something about this. Um, but this is what is causing your pain. This is how we have to go about, you know, doing activities, sports, going about a rehabilitation process, really going about a medication process. So it, it is a difficult catch-22 um, when they ask you that question. Okay, and what are your thoughts and opinions on muscle energy techniques? Yeah, muscle energy is great, particularly um, in um, uh, a younger uh, population, um, primarily. A lot of times, you know, the onset of back pain in an athlete is really stemming from uh, structural issues, such as do they have a tight hip flexor? Do they have... Um, their glute not firing appropriately? Do they have a strong, um, um, you know, um, quadratus lumborum? Uh, do they have a tight erector spinae? And what muscle energy really allows you to do is you really get to put the, activate the muscle 
in a way to cause it to relax, to cause the entire muscle, um, the muscles of the spine to fire properly to help an individual with pain. The problem is that you just can't rely on muscle energy once and say, okay, you're good to go. Oftentimes patients need multiple treatments of muscle energy. And that's where, you know, physicians, you know, chiropractors, um, physical therapists, athletic trainers even can do some basic, simple muscle energy maneuvers, which is really a direct technique that goes into the area of defect to relax that muscle. So it's very helpful. Okay. Uh, the next question is regarding in the military setting where the uh, military uh, person is doing a lot of rotational movements under load using their rucksack or kit. Do you have any recommendations to help prevent and train, uh, prevent back injuries uh, and train these populations? That, that are wearing like a heavy object? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, um, it, that's a, a big challenge um, on that because when you're wearing heavy equipment and you're also going through a lot, they're doing a lot of rotational forces, a lot of flexion and extension, they're at high risk of developing facet arthropathy later on. They're at high risk of developing a disc tear. They're at high risk of, um, you know, even getting a disc herniation. And so the only advice I can give, you know, people in the military is, you know, strengthening, you know, your core as much as possible. If you can not wear the object um, as much as possible, um, try to, one big thing that I think is very important, you know, with patients, and I educate patients with, that have to wear these things, is don't bend your back or extend your back with a heavy object if you have to go down to the ground and grab something or rotate. If you're having to rotate, rotate your entire body. Don't rotate your back with a heavy object. You're gonna get an annular tear very simply. If you have a heavy object and you're bending forward, you're at high risk of possibly getting a herniated disc. Bend your knees instead of putting your back at risk. So. There's simple back safety issues that you should more or less focus on if they have to wear a heavy object. And that's what I would advise. Okay, the next question on here is, what is your uh, experience or recommendations regarding gabapentin for uh, neurologic or radiculopathy symptoms? I use it off-label all the time. Um, the problem with patients on gabapentin or Lyrica is they um, use it as needed PRN basis. It's not meant to be a PRN medication. Um, and it, uh, the other big thing is you gotta know, do they have you know, other chronic medical conditions? Are they a good candidate for this? You start low on a low dose. You know, I typically start patients on 300 milligrams of gabapentin at night. Um, it helps them with sleep a little bit. Um, if they have complaints of drowsiness, they're going to bed, so the drowsiness really won't affect them. And usually patients say they have a little bit of improvement with their radicular symptoms. Um, Lyric is another option you know, as well, 75 milligrams BID that you could also prescribe, but it is very helpful off-label use for radicular pain. Okay, and the final question here is regarding McKenzie method. Um, or McKenzie exercises, how long would you recommend utilizing those, uh, particularly if you know, they're improving, not improving? Um, yeah, so the McKinsey method, yeah, the McKinsey method is a, you know, a technique, and it really depends on how long is it going to take you to isolate a lot of their pain generators to one single point of problem, and that might take longer, that might not take longer. Um, and so, um, usually through my experience is usually six to eight weeks of therapy, but it oftentimes is therapy, therapist dependent and is also dependent on pathology, um, and how long it truly takes to isolate it to a single area, but usually six to eight weeks is what I would say. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for attending tonight and, uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Uh, and thank you again to Dr. Gogu for presenting tonight. Uh, we do appreciate your time. Thank you so much, everyone. And once again, I apologize for the delay. Have a good night. All right, you too. Bye.